everyone. My name is Jen Driven. I am the um, head of external affairs for the National Aquarium. So it's my pleasure just to welcome everybody here to have this important discussion this afternoon. Um, this is our Animal Care and Rescue Center in historic Jonestown, which is the oldest neighborhood in Baltimore. Um, we opened this facility back in 2018. Um, it host, homes our seal rescue operation, our water quality testing, our veterinary clinic, all of our quarantine facilities, et cetera. Um, and this is, you are right now in the Nancy and Lou Grasman classroom, which we host a bunch of school groups that come through here on a weekly basis. Um, so we're really proud of this brand new facility and certainly um, honored to host this important discussion about fisheries today. And I just want to thank uh, Congressman Huffman and Congressman Sarbanes for being here today to have this important discussion. And I'm going to hand it over. Well, thank you, Jen. Yes. Thank you so much, and, and thanks to the National Aquarium for hosting us and for being such a great leader on uh, conservation and marine policy. Before we go any further with this listening session, and I'm just delighted to be with all of you and can't wait to hear from our panelists, uh, I have the real pleasure of uh, allowing my colleague John Sarbanes, who represents this part of uh, beautiful Baltimore, to welcome all of us to his district. And uh, as he does that, let me just say, uh, John, and I'm not just saying this because I'm in his company right now, uh, is just one of the bright stars uh, of the United States Congress. I enjoy working with him on all sorts of issues. He's super smart. He's super talented in principle. Baltimore is really lucky to have them, to have him representing them in Congress. So thanks, John. Thank you very much, Jerry. I've known Jerry here from Washington, so he promised to say all of those nice things uh, in return. I'm going to get out of your way because the, the testimony that's going to come forward here is obviously very, very critical, and I want to thank um, Jared for coming to Baltimore and being part of assembling the wisdom that's in this room from the witnesses that you'll hear from on a very, very important topic. Um, he's been a leader on the environment from before he got to Congress, but he brought a lot of that expertise and portfolio into his work um, in Washington, and it's made a huge difference. He now shares a very, very subcommittee that is uh, assembling important perspective and insight on the issues that all of you care about. So um, it's great to have you here in Baltimore. Uh, thanks for making us a stop on this very, very important tour and listening session that you're doing. Look forward to what folks have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you all very right. much. And I, I think I have a microphone, yep. so I hand it back to you. Okay. Terrific. Let's dive in. Um, for those uh, who don't know me, I, I was already introduced, and I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. My district's on the other side of the country, of course. I represent the north coast of California, but I, uh, like my friend John Sarbanes, I have a lot of working waterfronts and people in my district that make their living on the water. So these issues that we're talking about here uh, are near and dear to me. This is the third stop on my Magnuson Stevens listening tour. And I'm really glad to be kicking off our East Coast session uh, here in Baltimore for the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, from my work in Congress and in working with colleagues whose districts, like John's, include coastal communities, I know that commercial and recreational fishing industries have played an important role uh, in the history and the economies of communities all across the Atlantic coast, including uh, here in the Mid-Atlantic and Baltimore. I'll give you a quick background on this nationwide listening tour and what I'm trying to do here. Um, my goal is hopefully to reset the conversation about federal fisheries management and uh, if we can take a little bit of the, the politics out of it. Uh, marine fisheries policy has become too partisan even during my time in Congress and I'd like to do my part to make that better. Uh, my plan is to spend the next several months visiting fishing regions all over the country to hear from a wide range of experts and stakeholder voices in open public meetings. I want this to be very transparent and accessible to everyone who's interested uh, in these subjects. The Magnuson-Stevens Act, of course, uh, is proof that an emphasis on science and sustainability actually works. Uh, through the science-based annual catch limits that are one of the pillars of the Magnuson Act, also rebuilding requirements and other important conservation and management standards, 
overfishing in this country has been reduced and a record number of stocks have been rebuilt. That means people can keep fishing uh, and that's a big deal. I think the Magnuson Act, when implemented correctly, has been successful in supporting fisheries in the United States. Um, that doesn't mean it's perfect, but I think it's important to acknowledge the successes that we have been able to achieve. Now, there are also many challenges that we face today and that we know we're going to face in the future, whether it is climate change or maintaining sustainable fisheries and coastal economies. I hope we can tackle all of these things and many more issues today as we think about uh, what a reauthorized and modernized Magnuson Act should look like. So I want to thank our panelists for being here to be part of this conversation. Thanks to everyone here in the audience for taking the time out of your day to join us to talk about fisheries. Uh, and lastly, I want to uh, do a quick outline of how this conversation will go. We will start with remarks from our panelists. And to save time, uh, I would love to give you flowery introductions for each and every one of them. But I, I think what I'll do is just ask them to introduce themselves so we can keep moving through the substance of the conversation. After we've made it through the panel, we'll open it up to a discussion and an opportunity for questions from the audience. I might. Uh, take the congressman's prerogative and pose a few of the first questions, but we will quickly get to the point where you can ask questions of me or of anyone on the panel, and then we will close the event by opening up the floor to public comment uh, for anyone who came here with something they want me to hear or our panelists to hear. So I ask only that we be respectful of each other. Remember that the focus here is on federal fisheries management. And with that, um, I would like to kick things off by handing it off to our speakers. Um, I'm not sure if, if the panel has discussed an order with which to begin. My notes don't refer to who goes first. So uh, <laughs> uh, how about we start down on my far right? John, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the opportunity to speak here. My name is John Wiedemann. I'm a professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources. I'm also a member of the newly formed Rutgers Center for Fisheries and Ocean Sustainability. Uh, my research is broadly interested in sustainable management of marine fisheries with an emphasis on population dynamics of marine fisheries, stock assessment, which is the modeling approach with how we estimate how many fish are in the ocean, as well as um, management making in under uncertainty, so something called management strategy evaluation. Um, I should, a bit of a disclaimer, a lot of my research has been funded by the Mid-Atlantic and New England Council since I've been in the area. Uh, I'm also a member of the New England Scientific and Statistical Committee. Uh, all the opinions I present here today are mine and mine alone. Um, but I just wanted to start off by, by noting that the Northeast US is one of the most rapidly warming ocean regions in the world. Um, we're also in a unique position in that we have a whole number of states that are aligned in the region that may have somewhat competing interests in terms of fisheries management. Um, but it's, it makes it an interesting place to do research, um, although it's, at times can be a little bit sobering. Um, fisheries management historically has been looking in the rear view mirror. A lot of our, our benchmarks, what we try to achieve, is based on the past dynamics and climate change certainly threatens that, our ability to uh, rebuild to certain targets or thinking about how we manage things um, based on the past might not be applicable to the future. Um, in response to the ocean warming, one of the most well-known responses is that fish change the, their spatial distribution. In our region, that means they're moving northward, they're moving deeper. Um, this, of course, sets up conflict as species move across the artificial boundaries between states, between management councils, and between nations. We recognize those boundaries, but fish do not. Um, for example, summer flounder and black sea bass in the mid-Atlantic have exhibited considerable northward shifts over the past few decades, which sets up con consistent conflict between state-specific allocations and recreational fisheries, as well as conflict between councils where there, these fish are starting to appear in New England as well. Um, commercial fishermen must travel farther from their ports to access their historical target species, uh, particularly if they're prevented access from species that are newly arriving in their region. Um, and this particularly puts smaller vessels at a disadvantage. New fisheries legislation must confront this challenge by allowing for dynamic allocation spatially and also allowing for increased flexibility in entry and exit from fisheries. In addition to shifting distributions, climate change will impact uh, 
uh, species through changes in what we call production, both positive and negative, changes in mortality, growth, uh, and reproductive success. There will be winners and losers, uh, but if we use the historical benchmarks as where we need to be, um, it could set up for some challenges, particularly um, in cases where we have stocks that may not ever be able to rebuild to what they were historically, uh, and those stocks might limit access to other fisheries um, that are doing quite well. As an example, uh, recent catches of yellowtail flounder on Georgia's bank have been less than 5% of the estimated population size, which is quite low historically, um, yet the stock is still declining, which gives support to the idea that the environment is going to prevent this, is preventing the stock from recovering. Um, unfortunately, yellowtail are bycatch in some of the most valuable and healthy fisheries in the country, Georgia's bank paddock and sea scallops. So um, it's a constant point of, of conflict when, and decision making where how do we try to rebuild something that's probably not going to rebuild and yet could cost millions of dollars based on what we set as a quota? I don't have an answer to that question and what we should do forward, but I think um, new legis the changes in legislation need to take into account these uh, dynamic reference points. Um, we may, um, personally, I think we need to move away from these biomass based targets, but that we should really just focus on getting fishing mortality rates low. In that, in that sense, if we do that, we will, um, if climate change has, has impacted our stocks in, in a negative way, that um, it may not rebuild to MSY levels, but we won't have as restrictive mandated policies that um, limit access to other fisheries. Uh, finally, I just want to emphasize that rain shifts and changes in productivity can severely impact our ability to estimate how many fish are in the sea. Um, the Northeast US is actually one of the most data rich regions in the world and yet uncertainty in many of our assessments is increasing, uh, unfortunately. Uh, these assessments must pass peer review by independent experts, but if there's considerable uncertainty, they may be rejected, which means they fall into the data poor category. Um, examples from the Mid-Atlantic where this has happened include Atlantic mackerel, black sea bass, and weak fish. Uh, fortunately, new assess more recent assessments for those stocks have passed, um, but in New England, Georgia's Bank Yellowtail flounder, Georgia's Bank cod, and witch flounder have, have failed review and are now data poor. Uh, and to me, that's particularly sobering that Georgia's Bank cod, one of our most iconic national fisheries, is a data poor stock currently. And climate change is likely a major contributor to this. Uh, in that regard, I don't think new legislation is going to aid it, but we need, we need more resources to help address these questions. More resources for uh, data collection programs, more resource for uh, NOAA to in increase employment for the people to do these assessments and deal with the problems. Um, because otherwise, without a better understanding of how these things are gonna impact our ability to assess and determine how many there are, the legislation itself is not going to solve the problem. So um, I've been watching a lot of congressional testimony lately, so I want to say I yield back the remainder of my time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said that. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Pam Lyons Roman, and I am the executive director of Wild Oceans. Founded by anglers in 1973, Wild Oceans is a national conservation group focused on marine fisheries. You could say that our organization evolved with the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Originally focused on ending the uncontrolled fishing off our shores that decimated our fish stocks, our mission now recognizes that the future of fishing depends on valuing healthy ecosystems in our approach to fisheries management. The 2006 MSA reauthorization brought about pivotal change to our national fisheries management program, separating science decisions, how many fish can we catch, from allocation decisions, who catches them, where, when, and how. 45 stocks have been rebuilt over the last decade, and the percentage of stocks declared overfished or experiencing overfishing has declined significantly. Improved stock status enabled our regional councils to dedicate more time to proactive management. In 2016, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council established the Frank R. Lautenberg Deep Sea Coral Protection Area, conserving 38,000 square miles of fragile deep sea coral habitat. The unmanaged forage omnibus amendment, implemented a year later, prevents the development of new or expanded commercial fisheries for 16 forage species groups 
until impacts on the ecosystem can be evaluated. But progress towards sustainability stalls when that progress necessitates a paradigm shift in traditional ways we have managed. Working outside the box of single species management to ensure the needs of other wildlife and other fisheries are being met. This is where the next reauthorization can play an important role. And I will give three examples. Forage fish management standards. Forage species are common prey for a wide range of predators are an important, and are an important source of standing biomass in the ecosystem. There is consensus among the scientific community that to protect their role in the food web, forage species should be managed using more conservative fishing targets and limits to maintain their populations above biomass levels associated with maximum sustainable yield for MSY. This advice has been incorporated into National Standard 1 guidelines, yet none of the regional councils have taken steps to adopt this advice. We recommend that Congress insert a forage fish policy into the required provision section, specifying that the minimum biomass threshold be set above the MSY level and that the target population be substantially higher. Bridging the gap in river herring and shad management. No forage group in the Atlantic is as much at risk as our anadromous river herrings and shads, which are depleted to historic lows, forcing nearly all state fisheries to close at great economic and social costs to coastal communities. River herring and shad spawn in river systems, but spend most of their lives in federal waters where they are vulnerable to bycatch. Because they are often retained and sold, they are not recognized as bycatch under the MSA. The ASNFC oversees an interstate shad and river herring management plan, but in the federal management arena, shad and river herring conservation needs are often overshadowed by the economics of fisheries that are federally managed. Bycatch caps put in place by the Mid-Atlantic and New England councils to conserve river herring and shad have become more liberal to prevent costly fishery closures, and overall bycatch is increasing. If we are to rebuild river herring and shad stocks, a holistic plan is needed that conserves these species throughout their life cycle. A federal river herring and shad plan should be created to complement the interstate plan. Finally, fishery ecosystem plans. The ecosystems on which our marine resources depend are being altered as a result of climate change. Warming ocean temperatures, acidification, and extreme climate variations are altering fish habitat, distribution, and biodiversity. Climate change impacts are compounded by non-fishing human activities that put fishing grounds and habitat at risk, activities over which the regional councils have little say. The future of fishing depends on building resiliency in our ecosystems and in our fishing communities. The time is past due to incorporate the recommendations of the 1999 Ecosystem Principles Advisory Panel, EPAP, report to Congress into the MSA. Fishery ecosystem plans should be required for each region and also for Atlantic highly migratory species that adhere to the eight criteria outlined in the EPAP report with three additional NOAA fisheries recommendations. Ecosystem goals and objectives, trade-off analyses, and ecosystem indicators designed for management decisions. Only four councils have developed FEPs, and they vary widely in how they address the EPAP recommendations, and some recommendations are omitted altogether. We note that earlier this year, NOAA Fisheries released a series of plans to implement its ecosystem-based management roadmap, and that FEPs create that framework necessary for effective implementation. Thank you, I believe I've used my time. I look forward to working with you. Thank you for yield back as well. I yield back. If there's any time left, <laughs> I tried to tie myself to get every bit. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Huffman, and thank you for the opportunity to provide the Atlantic States perspective on reauthorization. Thanks. Uh, I'm Bob Beal, the Executive Director of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is a compact of the 15 Atlantic coastal states, and we are um, formed to manage nearshore migratory marine resources. 
Congress granted ASMFC uh, unique management authority through the Atlantic Strike Bass Act, the Atlantic Coastal Act, and um, right now, today, ASMC manages 27 species of uh, commercially and recreationally valuable stocks, uh, nine of which we cooperatively manage with our federal partners, the New England Council, the Atlantic Council, and the South Atlantic Council, as well as fellow fishers. Um, as others have noted, the rapidly changing ocean environment is significantly impacting the Atlantic Coastal, Atlantic Coast uh, marine resources we depend on for food, employment, and re uh, recreation. Some species like northern shrimp have not responded to even the most extreme management measures. The harvest moratorium has been in place since 2014 for this cold water dependent fishery, and the stock is still not rebounded. Likewise, the iconic American lobster is severely depleted in the southern range. Uh, ASMC stock assessments indicate the lobster's plight is not due to overfishing, uh, but environmental conditions uh, preclude successful spawning in the, in the southern region. Unfortunately, we may be seeing the same warning, uh, warning signals in the Gulf of Maine. For other species such as black sea bass and summer flounder, um, their ranges are expanding to the north and to the east, as John mentioned. Um, this expansion has created a growing discrepancy between the historical, uh, historically based state-by-state -state commercial quotas and the current distribution of stocks. The current version of the Magnuson Stevens Act provides limited flexibility to deal with changing distributions, especially when management authority is shared by ASMSC and uh, regional management. Reauthorization to acknowledge the effect of warming waters and on species ranges and obligating councils and commissions to explore allocation options to reflect uh, current species distribution. Reconsideration of allocation is not limited to commercial fisheries only. Uh, improvements in the Marine Recreational Information Program's uh, fishing effort survey have re-estimated nearly 40 years of recreational harvest. Uh, this recalibrated data has shown that the harvest may be underestimated by as much as 300% in some areas. ASMC and the Midland Council initiated joint management action in October to reevaluate allocations between commercial and recreational fisheries, the summer flounder, scalp, and black sea bass. Uh, this process will take many years and produce an uncertain result. Congress should uh, provide increased flexibility to the councils and commission to more efficiently react to updated data in mixed use fisheries. Um, recreational annual catch limits under the Magnuson Stevens Act and the current recreational data collection effort are out of sync. Uh, the Marine Recreational Information Program was never designed to monitor quotas or make incidents of adjustments. Uh, it, was looked, it was designed for long-term uh, trends in fisheries. If annual catch limits are to remain, managers need flexibility to look at multiple years of catch and effort data when determining whether removals are at or below annual catch limits. Uh, the system has been successful at interstate levels such as species uh, such as um, as I mentioned earlier, Congress granted ASMC unique management authority. Through the Atlantic Coastal Act, um, the, 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 uh, Congress agreed to support the expanded role and require the Department of Commerce and Interior to provide scientific assistance, including the collection of uh, fishery management data and, uh, and fishery planning. We understood that the resources are scarce, but we would request that any Magnuson Stevens reauthorization reinforce and strengthen the existing commitment by federal partners to support the commission. Uh, of particular concern are fishery independent surveys that support effective fish management uh, of horseshoe crab, American lobster, northern shrimp, and Atlantic Mendy, as well as NEMAP and CMAP surveys, which provide long, long time series of data to support assessments and management. Um, we also must strive to incorporate uh, ecosystem considerations into management. Fishery managers have long known the, the complexities of linking predators, prey, and their dependent habitats. However, uh, recent advances in science and modeling now are offering managers a chance to take the first step in managing at the ecosystem level. Just last week, the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Menhaden Ecological Reference Points Benchmark Stock Assessment was peer reviewed through the CDAR process and will now be allowed or able to um, manage predators and prey holistically along the coast. As I've said before, the Magnuson Stevens Act has been and continues to be a very successful management uh, and conservation tool, but as with all tools, it needs to be sharpened from time to time. Um, top amongst these uh, updates is adapting to climate change uh, and ocean impacts, incorporating new management and science tools, and ensuring fishery managers have the data and financial resources they need to effectively manage fisheries under their care. On behalf of the 15 Atlantic coastal states, thank you for this opportunity, and we're standing by to help you as you develop legislation to strengthen the Magnuson Stevens Act for the next generation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
afternoon. My name is Mike Wayne. I'm the Oceanic Fisheries Policy Director for the American Sport Fishing Association. Chairman Huffman, thank you for putting this important listening session together and for including me on behalf of the American Sport Fishing Association, which is a trade association representing the sport fishing industry. With so many major metropolitan areas along the coast, there's naturally a lot of recreational fishing in the Mid-Atlantic region. The region is home to 2.4 million recreational anglers who have 4.4 billion annual sales impact and support over 40,000 jobs. While the Magnuson-Stevens Act has been largely successful in ending overfishing and rebuilding depleted fish stocks, it has also created several challenges that we continue to work through. The first thing I want to talk about is reliable catch data. The law states that the collection of reliable catch data is essential to effective conservation management and scientific understanding of fishery resources. MREC, the major data source for the recreational fishery, has had several improvements throughout the years, but it is still designed to provide regional estimates of trends in catch. The amount of uncertainty and time lags with MREC continue to pre create considerable challenges with how we use the data to satisfy the requirements of MSA. For example, we set an annual catch limit on the recreational fishery and then try to use a single point estimate of catch from MRIP to evaluate the fishery's performance against the ACL. MRIP was not intended to be used that way and it's impacting the management of our fisheries and our fishing communities. Simply put, we need to match the way we manage our fisheries with the data that we have while we continue to improve our data collection program. This is why ASA and others were supportive of the Modern Fish Act. And by the way, Chairman Hoffman, thank you for voting yes on Modern Fish and for you and your staff helping usher through the House <coughs> the version that was ultimately enacted. Modern Fish Act directs NOAA and the councils to pursue alternative recreational fisheries management approaches that work within the ACL framework. Additionally, Modern Fish Act focuses on better data collection, including looking into alternative sources like smartphone technology to supplement the current MRIP data. The second topic I'd like to focus on is prioritizing applied research. We think language in Section 404 of the Act could be strengthened to prioritize applied research that would help advance science and management objectives in the FMP. As we all know, resources are limited when it comes to addressing all the data gaps that we have for various species managed on our MSA. Flip to the back of any stock assessment and you'll find an extensive list of research needs to help improve our understanding of the fisheries we manage. Additionally, although the Act requires it, there are rarely adequate socioeconomic analyses conducted to help inform management decisions. We understand conservation of the resource is of paramount importance, but we also want our fishing communities to thrive, and so we should be prioritizing funds to help thoroughly evaluate the economic impacts of the management decisions made under MSA, especially when it comes to allocation decisions. There is great opportunity to further develop cooperative research for the recreational fishing industry to help inform economic analysis, as well as partner with recreational fishermen to conduct on the water applied research that would help reconnect our industry to, science, to the scientific and management process of the Magnuson Stevens Act. The third topic I'd like to focus on is forage fish conservation. One area in which the Mid Atlantic region has been a leader is in protecting unmanaged forage fish. We hope language like the Forage Fish Conservation Act will allow all the regions of the country to follow the Mid Atlantic's leadership in this area. The Forage Fish Conservation Act will strengthen the MSA by one, defining forage fish, two, thoroughly evaluating whether conservation and management of forage fish is needed, and three, account for the needs of predators when setting ACLs for forage fish fisheries. Forage is a major driver of our ecosystem health, and yet MSA does not specifically afford forage the same protections it does for other species currently managed under MSA. 
adding specific language that highlights a critical component of the ecosystem will help us progress towards an ecosystem-based approach to fisheries management. Again, ASA recognizes the value, valuable contributions MSA has made toward fisheries conservation and management. Through continued refinements, improved data collection, and better implementation by NOAA Fisheries and the Council, we can see conservation benefits from MSA translate into better economy and increased fishing participation. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Robbins, managing partner of Fathom Edge Limited. Chairman Huffman, thank you very much for your nationwide tour to listen to fisheries constituents, and especially here today in the Mid Atlantic in Baltimore. I uh, really appreciate you doing that and as you consider the reauthorization of the Magnuson Stevens Act. Right? The Act's framework for biological sustainability is a gold standard and has produced a modern record of stock recovery and sustainability that we can all be proud of as a nation. The U.S. track record on sustainable fisheries and management. There's a standing testament to the fact that the Act is a remarkably well-conceived statutory framework for managing fisheries and an extraordinary experiment in uh, participatory governance. And <clears throat> I'll offer a few suggestions on areas of the Act that I think would benefit from additional review and consideration. Changes to the Act should be undertaken very carefully, and any changes that add requirements should be met with adequate investment. The Regional Fishery Management Councils are capable of remarkable innovation that comes from effective collaboration with regional fisheries communities. 148 nautical miles southeast of this meeting room, the Baltimore Canyon's forest of bubble gum corals lies protected within the deep sea coral prote protection zone that Pam previously described. The coral protection zone is just one example of the innovations the council has achieved when they engage and integrate the best resources of the fishing industry, the scientific community, and the public. In, as they work to advance the nation's interest in marine fisheries and ocean resources. As strong as the Act's biological standards are, the Act's ecological dimensions would benefit from additional consideration and integration. The ecological references in the Act are discretionary in contrast to the biological requirements. I know that the councils have concerns with the prescriptive definitions of forage fish that have been discussed recently, and I appreciate those concerns. I would also note that the councils are very good at meeting their legal requirements and suggest meeting in the middle with the requirements to consider ecosystem structure and function, trade-offs with other fisheries, and ecosystem objectives when setting quotas for forage stock. The science and management of offshore ecosystems along the Atlantic coast is disjointed. HMS manages apex predators, and the East Coast Councils manage their prey in relative isolation. These institutional interfaces should be integrated more effectively, and a sustained offshore diet study of HMS predators to be part of the agency's sustained ecosystem monitoring plan. Three years ago, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and justifiably so. In a single step in 1976, the Act gave the U.S. the sovereign authority over marine fisheries and established the eight regional fisheries management councils. We kicked out the Russians and the foreign fleets that were hammering our fish stocks and offering our marine ecosystem. The Act rightly positioned the U.S. industry to develop and Americanize our commercial fisheries. The Act was timely. 1976, when the U.S. needed to gain control of its fish stocks and develop our industry. 43 years later, our fisheries were largely mature, and this is an appropriate time to reflect on our experience and contemplate our future. National Standard 1 would ben should benefit from review. MSY is an exclusively yield-driven concept. While it may result in very appropriate outcomes for fisheries that are exclusively commercial without significant ecosystem exposures, other fisheries with large recreational components or with important structural roles in marine ecosystems may not enjoy optimal outcomes under this yield-driven standard. As an alternative, reconfiguring MS-1 to generate the greatest overall benefit to the nation, taking into consideration commercial fisheries, recreational fishing, and the productivity, structure, and function of marine ecosystems could position the nation's fisheries for a stronger future. I started crabbing commercially in the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries when I was 15 years old, and I've spent a career in developing commercial fisheries. I also had the privilege of participating in the management of state and federal fisheries through the Virginia Marine Resources Commission and the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. This reauthorization discussion provides an important forum to review our experience with fisheries development in the, East, in, the, in the U.S. The East Coast fisheries experience is riddled with fisheries that were developed in the absence of any science or management framework, often with difficult outcomes. I've been in the middle of several of those. Spiny dogfish is one example. Dogfish went from underutilized to a 60 million pound a year fishery in less than a decade. 
This happened with no management plan, no management measures, and no science, or limited science. Hundreds of boats quickly became economically dependent on the fishery, and processing plants were built from Maine to Virginia to accommodate the volume. When federal regulations were finally put in place in 2000, the directed fishery was effectively closed. Dayboat gill nutters up and down the coast were out of work. With U.S. fisheries now in a mature state, this is an appropriate time to review the act requirements related to developing fisheries. Climate change is already shifting stocks along the east coast of the U.S., which will increase the need to pay attention to unmanaged and developing fisheries. <coughs> Several councils have taken the important steps to control and monitor catches of unmanaged horde species. The Mid-Atlantic Council also receives an annual report from the regional office to notify managers of any changes in landings and unmanaged fisheries. Despite our checkered track record, however, with developing unmanaged fisheries on this coast, the act still leaves some species unmanaged and unprotected. The act should provide for fisheries development, certainly, but it should also include requirements for council review prior to developing a fishery at a significant level. Such an approach would be a reasoned departure from the develop, deplete, and rebuild cycle that has had devastating cumulative impacts on our coastal fishing community and would provide a basic management framework to facilitate stepwise and orderly development. As we consider the challenges of the future associated with climate change, we should also review the need for a stronger safety net for our coastal fishing community. I recently visited a gillnutter friend up in Chincoteague, and he reminded me that when he was young, there were 30 gillnutters on the island. Now there's six. The cumulative impacts of fisheries failures and regulations rendered many of our coastal fisheries untenable. In terms of governance issues associated with climate change, I'd encourage the committee to invest the liaison to the East Coast Council for voting rights. In preparing for future challenges of climate-related shifts in fish stocks, we also need an integrated coastwide monitoring system that provides managers with data on shifts in fish stocks and fisheries interactions. As stocks shift, it'll be even more important to have a solid understanding of commercial and recreational catches. Commercial monitoring recreational catch estimation systems should be funded at levels that will provide comprehensive commercial catch monitoring and accurate recreational catch estimations a parallel control with a self-reporting subset of the recreational community could, I think, help ground, trip, ground through the MREP wave estimates. And managers should also have some carefully developed flexibility to improve the management of recreational fisheries that are above their biological target. Also related to climate change, I think emergency rulemaking authority should be extended out to three years to give councils time to develop and implement amendments or normal rulemaking uh, procedures after implementing and requesting an emergency action. Based on my personal experience in the management system, I can testify that some of our nation's top scientists and staff analysts, and some of our most knowledgeable and engaged fishermen are bringing their best efforts forward to advance the management of U.S. fisheries on an ongoing basis through the council process. Our fisheries face challenges and opportunities, and I remain a strong believer in the ability of the council system to solve problems and advance the nation's interest in the management of our marine fisheries.
Um, the good news is that both science centers are working together to plan for an Atlantic Coastwide uh, Science Coordination Workshop, which I believe is going to occur sometime in the spring. But the challenge is, again, going to be having the resources to make those workshop recommendations a reality as our science centers are already stretched in and under-resourced meeting the mandates of the existing acts. So I think the bottom line is that in order for the councils to respond to climate change, we first need to be able to detect changes. And that brings me to governance. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council was, um, they held an East Coast Climate Change and Fisheries Governance Conference in 2014, which I think was really instrumental in starting this conversation. And over the past several years, the councils and the commission have used a variety of forums to facilitate discussions on the science and governance impacts of climate change. And so the conversations necessary to address this issue and develop responses have been and continue to occur, I think, the challenge is really in having the tools to evaluate how potential management and governance responses might impact our fishing communities and businesses. Um, approaches that balance patterns of historic use uh, with current resource distribution, such as those that are being explored by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, um, can allow for incremental adjustments and allocations that can minimize some of those impacts, but they really need to be coupled with social and economic models that can help us to better understand what those impacts are going to be. So I think addressing the governance impacts of um, climate change requires a collaborative and an ecosystem approach, and this is currently underway, and I just want to note that this is a major objective within the Mid-Atlantic Council's 2020 to 2024 strategic plan. I also want to touch on forest species, and this is where I might become a little bit unpopular. Um, clearly, maintaining an adequate forest space is extremely important, um, and while well intentioned, I do have concerns about mandating a definition of forest species, because I, I fear unintended consequences. I think, you know, everything is forage for something else at some point in its life cycle, and, you know, there is an extensive body of peer-reviewed literature that indicates the importance of keystone species, whether that's an apex predator or a mid-trophic level predator, and maintaining uh, the integrity of ecosystems and food webs. And so I think what we're trying to do here is maintain a balance of between resource use um, and ecosystem integrity uh, through the act. And I'll just note that different councils are handling forest species in different ways. Some of them are doing it through the use of fishery ecosystem plans or designation uh, as ecosystem component species. Um, you know, the Mid-Atlantic Council, I think, has, has um, forged a great path and set a great example for other councils and its creativity in using the existing authorities under the act to do so. Um, so the discretionary provisions do allow councils flexibility to use the information that they have available to start it in the manner most appropriate to address the ecosystem role. I do think some clarification is needed in the national standard guidelines with regard to the use of the ecosystem component designation. I think there is some inconsistent language in the preamble between the 10 factors that councils must consider when determining whether a a species is in need of conservation and management as compared to when it is appropriate for councils to designate species as ecosystem component designations. And then the final thing I want to touch on uh, is data infrastructure and reporting. I know that this is another discussion topic and maintaining and updating database infrastructure and technology is absolutely necessary for future efficiency security and continuity. It's not a very sexy topic, but it is um, absolutely critical, particularly as on the East Coast we move towards implementation of electronic reporting. Um, well, the benefits are tremendous, they're usually diffuse, and I think that's what makes it difficult to, to make a case for this. And then the final point I just wanted to make is um, with regard to electronic reporting. So we had three councils um, all at once a couple years ago who were moving forward with implementation of electronic reporting in the far higher sector, and based on my involvement within that process, I, it really would have been beneficial to have had additional guidance from headquarters, from the agency, earlier in the process, just to try to coordinate things like key data elements, reporting timeframes, et cetera, among regions, because right now we are in a situation where there is going to be duplicate reporting here on the East Coast. We have three different councils in two regions. Fishermen participate in different fisheries that are permitted by different regions, and we are going to be in a situation where, uh, because of that, some fishermen are going to have to report twice. So I would hope that as we move forward into uh, the next century of electronic mm -hmm. technology, that that can be addressed um, in a way that Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I yield to
for the rest of my friends. Okay, so you can this awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is <clears throat> Joe Semino. I'm with New Jersey uh, DEP. I'm the state director for the Marine Fisheries Administration. Um, as the state director, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a commissioner for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. I also sit on the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, and with your indulgence, Mr. Chair, and, and the audience, I, I'm not here representing either the council or the commission, but um, I'm you know, here as a, as a manager Understood. in this process. Um, so I don't, I'm going to forego an opening statement. Um, I'm very excited to get into the discussions we have. We have an excellent panel here today. Um, we have some important issues before us, and the NSA is our biggest school to deal with a lot of those. Um, I have a somewhat unique perspective to bring to the Mid-Atlantic management in that um, I started my career 20 years ago um, as a technician in the Hudson River Fisheries Unit at the New York State DEC. I spent uh, a couple of years in North Carolina in Division of Fisheries uh, with Michelle, um, and then spent 14 years at the Virginia Marine Resources Commission and, uh, you know, getting to know the, the Chesapeake and currently managing some of the iconic species of Maryland, striped bass and, and blue crabs. Um, so now that two years with New Jersey, I've, I've covered a good portion of the Mid-Atlantic and uh, I'd like to help bring that perspective here today. Um, I also have a somewhat personal connection with the MSA and that we both got started in 1976. <laughs> <laughs> Although the MSA is a little older. Than me. You didn't have to ever be real. That's correct. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. No, it might happen. Well, this is perfect. You've only taken up a minute, so it gets me nine, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't do that to you. These are Jersey rules. That's right. There are no rules. Um, just a, a brief introduction. Um, my name is Greg DiDomenico. I serve as the executive director of the Garden State Seafood Association. We are a commercial fish and trade association made up of all different gear types, shoreside processes, owner operators, big boats, small boats, and um, participate in an awful lot of fisheries up and down the coast and in numerous um, regions. Uh, first, of course, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor, and I hope this sets off um, a series of meetings where all of our colleagues can continue to talk like this and in other fashions because we have to do it to move ahead. So thank you. Um, I boiled down my uh, comments to your basic question, which was what is not working and what is working. So I'm going to be as direct as possible and try to do this in five minutes. So, um, the 2006 amendments to Magnuson-Stevens and their subsequent implementation fundamentally altered the way domestic fishery resources are managed. These new provisions focused on ending overfishing immediately, developing accountability in both recreational and commercial fisheries, rebuilding stocks as quickly as possible, all in the context of more intensive reliance on science. Since the implementation of the amendments, the U.S. seafood industry has lost access to robust fishery resources from the application of an overly precautious interpretation of the Act. While the rigid nature of annual adjustments of quotas may have reduced or eliminated overfishing of some directed fisheries, an outcome that we certainly support. In many ways, it's caused, it <clears throat> in many cases, it has also led to significant underfishing of some stocks. This is due primarily to a seemingly repetitive, precautionary application of risk-averse management culminating with significant and unpredictable quotas stemming from wildly fluctuating estimates of scientific uncertainty. That is not working. This has threatened the viability of the domestic seafood industry, undermined the trust of recreational and commercial stakeholders, and caused chronic instability. And that is not working. Adhering to an arbitrarily defined rebuilding period that may not exceed 10 years is not working. The National Academy of Science concluded that the 10 year rebuilding requirement was indeed arbitrary and harmful. Requiring that a species be labeled, labeled overfished, even if its current status may not be the result of fishing, it may be the result of something else, 
is not working. So let's get to the good part. What is working? Or better yet, who is working? Simply put, the council process of the Mid-Atlantic is absolutely working. The leadership of the Mid-Atlantic Council and its staff are absolutely working. They have protected the forage base and they've achieved many other accomplishments. The council has a long history of measures to protect and manage forage fish in the Mid-Atlantic, including annual catch limits, accountability measures, bycatch caps, and other management measures that are intended to prevent overfishing. They've made it a priority to protect the forage base through robust scientific analysis of the Mid-Atlantic ecosystem and have given serious consideration of the forage base and stock assessments. In 2016, the council prohibited the development of new and expansion of existing directed commercial fisheries on 16 unmanaged forage species in the Mid-Atlantic. Furthermore, the council dedicated an enormous amount of time and resources to managing river herring and shad. The council has determined that it's not necessary to manage river herring and shad under a council fishery management plan, but it has taken significant action to preserve them and they have made progress. This outcome was developed over an eight year period with an inclusive public process, an exhaustive regulatory pace with substantial scientific input. Despite this, <clears throat> and regardless of the extensive cost of the fishing industry, not everyone is satisfied and it is now looking for congressional intervention. Nothing could be more damaging than additional layers of unnecessary conservation burden, punitive measures, and broad definitions for forward species, and the obvious circumvention of the council process. The Mid-Atlantic Council is already dealing with shifting stocks and changing ocean conditions, and does not need a new mandate that will invite litigation by those who are not satisfied and seek to exploit the law. The Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council protected 38,000 square miles of deep sea coral habitat. A conservation initiative, despite its success, has been given hardly any attention at all. Lastly, the Mid-Atlantic Council has begun addressing the allocation dilemma, and I have no doubt that this situation will be, res will be resolved fairly. I only ask that the recreational organizations place an emphasis on accountability at the same time. In closing, um, if it's appropriate, Mr. Chair, I offer you my written comments to the five previous Magnuson Stephen hearings since 2009 to 2017. Thank you. Including the, my response to the committee chair after additional questions from the last Senate hearing were sent to me. Those offer solutions, not just complaints like today. But there's not enough time for that. Um, and I want to reiterate um, truthfully that um, it's my pledge for what I do and the people that I represent, that for all the people sitting around this table, I pledge to you that I am committed to working with you for the betterment of U.S. fisheries, both recreational and commercial. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Are you going to yield? Is there any left? <laughs> Please, Paul. Yeah, sure. A little tight here, sorry. We hope you at this end of the table actually get along well because uh, we did pack in some of the Well, the three of them, yes. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Um, uh, my name is Captain Paul Eidman, and I um, I run Real Therapy Fishing Charters in the Sandy Hook area of the New York, New Jersey bite. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to Congressman Huffman for uh, making the trip and um, giving us the opportunity to speak about such an important matter. Um, I guide uh, recreational anglers of all skill levels, um, targeting mainly striped bass, um, but also bluefish, fluke, false albacore. And lately, I am. I, I take people out bird watching and whale watching and, and bottlenose dolphin watching as well. And this is all due to the resurgence of many populations in our waters due to conservation efforts. Um, uh, you, you all should know that I sit on the executive board of the Jersey Coast Anglers Association uh, as a habitat and barred species committee chairman. 
and I'm the founder of Menhaden Defenders, Anglers Conservation Network, and River Herring Rescue. So obviously, I'm a barge fish geek. Um, having grown up as a kid fishing on Long Island, I have noticed many changes over the decades, and uh, some of those changes appear to be due to a failed fishery management system, um, including the disappearance of fish that we used to catch, like winter flounder, wheat fish, and mackerel. Others appear to be driven by changing ocean conditions, including summer flounder and black sea <coughs> populations migrating northward. The combination of poor management and changing, changing conditions is clearly a recipe for a disaster. One of the species that I care most about is in trouble, and that is the striped bass. Now that the ASMFC has declared that the stripers are overfished and overfishing is occurring, my ability, personally, to make a living on the water is in jeopardy. This issue has been brewing for a long time, and the weak management system of the ASMFC has failed to take precautionary steps necessary to prevent this situation. What's worse is that the food that our striped bass depend upon are being depleted by a foreign fishing operation, which flouts our regional fisheries regulations. That company is called Omega Protein, and it's owned by a Canadian company called Cook Incorporated. It's the only operation on the East Coast that still practices reduction fishing uh, for Atlantic Manhattan, which we call in New Jersey Bunker. So Bunker are often called the most important fish in the sea because of the critical role they play in feeding predator species and filtering water. Obviously, uh, without them, there's no fish, there's no whales, there's no birds, and everything else goes down the drain. So Cook Incorporated catches more than 150,000 metric tons annually of these forage fish and grinds them up into fish meal and fish oil for sale on an, inter excuse me, on an international commodities market for pennies a pound. And yet this Canadian company has willfully violated the reasonable cap established on catch in the Chesapeake Bay, a key nursery for all of our fish on the East Coast. The ASMFC recently found Virginia out of compliance and now it is time for Secretary of Commerce Ross to place a moratorium on this fishery. If we are going to effectively deal with climate change, fishery managers need to practice ecosystem-based fishery management, ensuring that enough bunker are left in the water for popular game fish species like the striped bass, bluefish tuna, and many more. We need resilient and abundant forage fish populations so that predator species can survive when facing stressful changes in ocean conditions. That's why it makes sense to place an outright ban on reduction fishing in the United States. Every single East Coast state has already done so within state waters, except for Virginia. And now it is time for the federal government to act. These bait fish are far more valuable when left in the water and serve the entire ecosystem the way they are supposed to. In my opinion, the antiquated practice of reduction fishing has run its course and should be terminated. Simply put, at a time when our waters are clearly suffering from damages from a number of different sources, continuing to deplete, deplete the very foundation of the marine food web is insane. Reduction fishing needs to be put out to pasture. At the same time, we need to do our part to min minimize our contribution to climate change by quickly converting to renewable energy sources. And the big news item lately is offshore wind and one source of renewable energy that relates directly, and it is one source of renewable energy that relates directly to recreational fishermen. I've been advocating for anglers for offshore wind to make sure the products, excuse me, the projects directly involve the recreational angling community and are developed responsibly. I got involved in this mainly because I see a major opportunity for increased fish habitat along our coastline as these new wind farms are installed. The marine life will stick to these foundations and dozens of new, if not hundreds, of new reef ecosystems will begin to occupy an otherwise barren seafloor. I see this, this as an innovative way to add much needed fish attracting habitat 
while at the same time stemming the tide of climate change and not continuing to burn fossil fuels that are poisoning and warming our waters as many game fish species continue to ship to cooler northern waters. All these reefs will become fish factories and create new recreational fishing opportunities. It will add to the economy and help rebuild our dying sport. I'm not stuck. So, so in summary, my four recommendations for addressing climate change and fishery management are as follows. We should quickly transition to ecosystem-based fisheries management. Uh, single species management in its current form has got to go. We should reform the ASMFC management system to provide for more conservation accountability and end the practice of reduction of fishery. Every single project product that Omega Protein makes can and should be replaced by a sustainable alternative. And we should move forward with renewable energy, such as offshore wind power, in a responsible manner with ecosystems in mind. Um, I really look forward to working together with you, and I thank you again for the opportunity to comment, and I hope that you will visit New Jersey and meet with our recreational fishing community. Thanks. Thank you. Obviously, we're gonna to get to questions in a minute, but before I let you go, am I correct that reduction fishing is using the fish to be ground up and reduced into some other product? Exactly. All right, just wanted to get that definition. Reduction is out. reduction. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Tony Friedrich. I am the Vice President's Policy Director for the American Saltwater Guide Association. We're extremely grateful to Congressman Huffman and his staff for their work on being champions for MSA and our fisheries and certainly for giving us the opportunity to share our view of what a healthy marine ecosystem looks like. When we first found out about this tour, the most intriguing thing in the process is that Congress, Congressman Huffman is including all of us. And by doing this, I feel that the Congressman is ensuring the long-term success of his efforts. Um, there's a wide array of voices and we all need to be heard. Uh, so thank you, Congressman. We appreciate it, just not for us, but for generations of fishermen yet to come. Uh, you and your staff have done a great job so far. If there's one takeaway from my speech, um, please let it be that there is an enormous value to fish left in the water. Yes, we do need to feed, feed the country. Yes, we do all need to work together, but managers also need to quantify and understand that abundant fish populations drive the economy. Um, Recreational angler behavior has changed greatly in the last 30 years. Uh, we, are, we are on the rise in choosing to catch and carefully release a large majority of the species that we pursue. Uh, these days, more and more, we're after the experience and not filling the cooler. As a real quick example, when striped bass population crashed in the early 80s, there were only 500,000 trips, uh, late 80s, early 90s rather, there were only 500,000 trips taken coastwide. When the sock reached its peak of abundance in 2006, there were 10.5 million trips. There's no change in how many fish we could kill post-moratorium post until then, but there were a lot more fish to catch, so people took more trips. And it's pretty clear to us that conservation is great for business. Abundance drives the economy, and just please don't forget that. Um, what I'd like everyone also to remember throughout this process is that none of us fight when there are a lot of fish in the water. When striped bass, summer flounder, bluefish, all around in good numbers, we spend our time talking about patterns, techniques, strategy. When those stocks are overfished, like now, people start pointing fingers, assessing blame. They try to make, they try to take from others instead of giving back to the resource. In order to have an equitable use of the resources and give full support to all the struggling coastal communities, we need a management framework that has a proven track record. Since 2006, Magnus and Stevens has that record of success. Sometimes it's really difficult to face catch restrictions, but it's far more difficult when the stock is no longer available. I'm gonna to touch on three topics really quick. First, um, previous calls for flexibility in federal management, second, the need for better data, and third, shifting stocks and what we're seeing out there. Um, many touted flexibility uh, with the Modern Fish Act, um, we need to modernize MSA, 
and they use the Atlantic State 3 Fisheries Commission and specifically striped bass as a way forward. I'm here to tell you that the flexibility that was being touted is doing far more harm than good. Uh, it's actually an example of what not to do. I don't blame the staff or the, of the commission. I blame the framework in which they operate. Uh, it pits one state against each other to struggle to fully exploit a resource rather than do what's best for it for all. Uh, I'll echo the many of the comments that I, I believe the Mid-Atlantic Council is doing great work. Uh, I think the flexibility inherent in that council uh, is really enabling the managers to do the right thing for everyone. Um, Stripe bass were once the poster child for recreational management, not so much anymore. Uh, at a 27 year low, we're looking at populations around the 1992 levels. They aren't the only victims of this flexibility. 17 of the 27 fish managed by the commission are overfished depleted or the status is unknown. We're suffering here in the Chesapeake Bay as well as the ocean. Those 17 species include critical, critical fish for guys like Paul, the people that I represent, we fish bluefish, cord species like, uh, it's obviously striped bass as well, cord species like herring, American shad, and even American eel. Um, all are critical to the economy, as well as a good balance to the ecosystem, and all are victims of flexibility inherent in the commission. We need consistency. That's a word I'd love to see used. We'd like to be able to plan out five years for our business models. Um, as a personal example, with the way everything looks right now, I need, a, I need new engines for my big boat. Price tag's over $30,000, and it's not gonna happen next year. Um, that's time that I'm gonna lose on the water with my son. Um, it's an incredible amount of gas, food, gear that I probably won't be buying, and kind of all due to flexibility. It's incredibly disheartening for me. Um, if one thing comes out of this reauthorization effort, We'd like to see the commission uh, restructured to mimic more of successful efforts in the council. We've tried flexibility over and over again and it's never worked on the East Coast. Um, we need management that allows us to count on fish being around next year and the year after that. We need that consistency. On to data and science. Um, fisheries management is tough, it's not a hard science. There's much that we don't know. And rec recreational anglers represent a bottleneck in that process. We have incredible, vast numbers, possess technology that even blows my mind when I get on a boat sometimes. Um, and we have an enormous impact on the economy as well as the resource. My sector, the people that I represent, we want to improve data collections methods. We desperately want to provide managers with the information they need to provide us with the guidance that we desire. Um, the previous data collection program, MRFs, was not that great. MRIP is a huge improvement. The National Academy of Sciences uh, approved, recently reviewed and approved MRIP with recommendations. Uh, some of those recommendations included more funding for science and surveys. This will go a long way in helping our sector step up to the plate and be more accountable. Um, on to shifting stocks, I don't know if you guys realize what we caught in the Bay this year. Um, there were two new state records in Maryland, one for triple tail and one for Florida Pompano. We caught tarpon, white shrimp, grouper jacks, a myriad of other southern species. This isn't normal. Every year we're seeing more and more southern species call the bay home and things are changing. And any fisherman is gonna tell you that. We need to dedicate some dollars to allow greater focus on the impacts of these shifting stocks. Most concerning are species that are interacting that never did before. There's gonna be winners and losers, and it's happening at an accelerated rate, and there isn't much time to ramp up the research. So please, let's meet this challenge head on. We're losing critical habitat, reef systems, oysters, marshes, submerged aquatic vegetation. It goes without saying that if we intend to address the stability of our shared marine ecosystem, we need to support initiatives that'll stem the tide of our habitat loss. And finally, we need to protect forage species like herring and menhaden. We can't constantly fish down the base of an ecosystem and make it, expect everything to be okay. We need, we need to manage forage species relative to their importance to the entire ecosystem and not as a single species. All of these issues point towards a reauthorization that has teeth. Recreational anglers do need to step up to the plate and be willing to do uh, what is needed to restore our marine resources. We're an enormous economic driver that so many coastal communities depend upon and we need that consistency in management. Scientists need more funding for recreational data collection to study and to study shifting fish stocks. And frankly, Congressman, we're in a little bit of trouble right now. 
we do want a vibrant marine ecosystem that can provide for all of us, not just one sector. And we wanted to have a keen eye on preserving the resource for future uh, fishermen. Thank you again, Congressman Huffman, for being a great steward of the resource. What you're doing is a really noble endeavor, and we want you to, you to know that we're here to help you along the way, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting us here today. I'm Charles Whittick. I'm a recreational fisherman from West Babylon, New York. I'm a writer and an attorney who specializes in fisheries conservation matters. Caught my first fish over 16 years ago. And since then, I've had the opportunity to fish on every coast of the United States. My experience over that time and in those places has given me a good idea of what works and what doesn't work with, with respect to fisheries management. Magnuson Stevens works. It has led to the restoration of 46 once over fish stocks in the Mid Atlantic and elsewhere. More importantly, it has compelled fe federal fisheries managers to intervene to prevent once rebuilt stocks from becoming overfished again. When an overproven caused the summer flounder stock to decline 19 in 2016, managers acted promptly and decisively to protect it from becoming overfished again. Unfortunately, Magnuson Stevens only governs federal fisheries. In short, the most important species are managed cooperatively by the states through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And in all of its history, the commission has failed to rebuild even one overfished stock and then maintain that stock at healthy levels over the long term. Even the striped bass, which the commission successfully brought back from collapse in 1995, is again overfished and enduring overfishing. For instead of taking prompt action when striped bass abundance began to decline, as the Mid-Atlantic Council did with summer flounder, the Commission failed to take adequate action when below average improvement began to take its toll. After a 2011 stock assessment update warned that striped bass would become overfished by 2017, the Commission maintained that it was still a green-like fishery and did nothing. A 2013 assessment triggered a provision in the management plan that required the commission to rebuild the stock within 10 years. The commission ignored the plan's explicit requirement and never put a rebuilding plan in place. A 2014 change to the management plan required recreational fishermen in Chesapeake Bay to reduce fishing mortality by 20.5%. Instead, those anglers increased fishing mortality by more than 50%. The commission never held those anglers accountable and landings remain at high levels. Even today, when striped bass are again overfished, the Commission is delaying development of the 10-year rebuilding plan that its own management plan requires. That's the wrong way to manage one of the most important recreational fisheries in the nation. Yet the Commission's management of the Tautog fishery is even worse. By 1996, the Commission knew that Tautog were overfished and experiencing overfishing. Not, o not only do those problems still exist today, but the current version of the management plan adopted two years ago only has a 50% chance of overfishing on the Long Island Sound population by 2029. There is no deadline for rebuilding the stock at all. East Coast anglers and East Coast fish stocks deserve better. The failure to rebuild and maintain healthy and inshore fish stocks is not the fault of the commission staff who work hard and do a very good job. It's the fault of the species-specific management boards, which are dominated by individuals who have close ties to fishermen in the fishing industry and tend to elevate fishermen's short-term wants above the long-term needs of the fish stocks they manage. After the regional fishery management councils prove themselves unwilling and unable to end overfishing and rebuild overfish stocks for much of the same reasons, Congress passed the Sustainable Fisheries Act 1996, which for the first time required that federal fisheries managers end overfishing, promptly rebuild overfish stocks, and base their management actions on the best available science. Actions which failed to meet those basic standards could be challenged in court. For the Commission to live up to its potential, we need what might be called the Sustainable Atlantic Coast Fisheries Act which amends the Atlantic Coastal Fisheries Cooperative Management Act 
which governs the ASMRC in a similar way. I have often pointed out that if you want to have a fishing industry, it helps to have fish. That's particularly true in recreational fisheries, where abundance clearly drives effort, which it drives revenues. A strong Magnus and Stevens helps to create and maintain such abundance, requiring the commission to end overfishing and promptly rebuild overfish stocks, would provide the same benefits for inshore fisheries. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, this was a terrific uh, framing of a whole bunch of issues, and uh, I am uh, trying to get my head around uh, much of what we just heard. Uh, there's a lot that we could go into uh, as we move into the question and dialogue part of this, of this forum, but uh, one of the things I want to start with, because it, it came up from several of our panelists, is the challenge of getting um, accurate, reliable, uh, and cost-effective data. Uh, and it sounds to me like several of the, of the experts and stakeholders that we heard from um, believe that uh, recreational data is just fundamentally uh, a tough part of this challenge. Uh, there was reference to some uh, innovations and new systems for gathering recreational data, but I also know that um, you know this, there, are, there are different types of recreational fishers out there. There are sophisticated guides and charters that may have the ability to use certain technology, and then there's a family out for a day on the water. And uh, you know how we allocate those burdens and uh, how we come to rely on the different types of data we get is uh, it's a tough one to get one's head around, and so. Uh, I want to just very specifically pose the question for any of you that want to speak to it. What should a reauthorized Magnuson Act uh, say about this particular challenge? We're, we're obviously going to have to tackle data because we hear about it. I hear about it everywhere we go from every sector. Uh, but with respect to the inherent challenge of getting good, reliable, cost-effective, recreational fishing data, uh, what can we do better? Getting better data is difficult because right now we use a survey and it works very well for commonly caught species when we use them on coastwide basis. What we, one of the things we have to be careful of is that not that the data is bad, but it's being used inappropriately. It's not meant to be to, to used to set recreational limits on a state by state level or on a sector by sector level. We should be applying data on a coastwide level. We should be following, actually, the instruction in Madison to manage a stock as a whole and be much less tolerant of regulations that change from state to state, from sector to sector, from time of year to time of year. We have, we have fisheries. I think one example I can give is a black sea bass fishery in one of our states where they have three different size limits, three different seasons, and three different bag limits. But that is not meant to reflect them. And that type of limit is going to cause problems. But the other thing we can do accepting the shortcomings of the data, and perhaps this is something that can belong in the bill. Right now we have language in the bill that says that the acceptable biological catch can't exceed the level set by the scientific and statistical committee. It's very appropriate that something is in that section that specifies that the committee must consider scientific and management uncertainty in setting the limits. So you don't set at the ABC if you have uncertainty, but you might be overfishing because of the uncertainty in the data. You need buffer. That's already in the guidelines, the National Standards Guidelines. It is not explicitly in the statute. Other thoughts? Yeah. So I think there's two possible fixes here. One would be to try to improve the data collection system that would allow us to be more comfortable with using that data the way we do it in management. The way we do it in management. And I don't know exactly how this would work in the act, but possibly supplementing MREP 
with other state-run programs that would help us ground truth information that MRIP is providing. Um, and so there's other regions, like the Gulf region has done something similar to help develop specific data collection programs that are geared towards the fisheries and the fish that the data are being collected on. So that's one side of the fix. The other side of the fix would be to allow some flexibility in how we manage using the data that we have if we aren't able to improve it through um, changes in mindset. So ultimately what we're talking about there is possibly using multiple years of catch to evaluate against an annual catch limit instead of single point estimates that come out of the MLIP program. So I think what I'm trying to get at is there's two possible fixes to the data conundrum of those recreational fisheries. Is, there, is it fair to say there's probably going to be inherent uncertainty in the data we get, especially from the recreational sector, and, and we're left with a policy challenge of what do you do in the face of that uncertainty? Um, Greg has said that he, he's, I don't think he's going to like the buffer approach because I think he's going to say that that's going to lead to underfishing. We already got it. Okay. But I know some other uh, stakeholders feel strongly that in, in that situation, you err on the side of caution and you apply the precautionary principle. So um, is that just the, the policy conundrum we have here? Can we, can we sharpen it and, and do any better? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I guess I would offer a, a couple of observations. When the uh, Mid-Atlantic Council went through its uh, visioning and strategic planning process, we did a lot of port meetings, a lot of outreach with recreational and, com and commercial constituents. And one of the consistent themes that we heard was that there was a lack of confidence in the science and the data that were used to manage the region's fishery. And, and that, that lack of confidence looked different depending on whether you were talking to a recreational group or a commercial group uh, or the environmental community. Um, and, and yet, uh, there, was a, there was a lack of buy-in, I think, in particular with the recreational community in the data collection system. Um, since then, uh, MREP has been significantly improved. Um, and, so uh, as, as ZimRIP has, has gotten better, um, I think uh, some, of that, some of that has been addressed, but Mike talked about the scale of our recreational fisheries and their economic scope. And one of the ways that we can reduce uncertainty is to increase sampling in our recreational data collection. And if we increase sampling, we can reduce uncertainty for those species that are commonly encountered. Uh, that increase in sampling isn't gonna cure the, the rare event species, but you know, I, I continue to think that if we engage the recreational public uh, in, a, in, a, in an intentional way to collect data and provide that provide that data as a subset of the recreational population, um, I think we could try to find ways to use that in, in ways that haven't been done in the past in our region. Um, because right now there's still a sort of a disconnect uh, between the, the recreational community and the data that we use to manage that fishery, and that that spills over all the way through the management process. Um, it, the, the problem is compounded. And, and furthermore, the, uh, in, in the Northeast region, our age-based stock assessments, the biggest scaler of those population estimates is catch. So that becomes a critically important input in, in determining what that population estimate is and what the sustainable quotas are coming out of that. So we have to have, we have, to have good data going in both for commercial catch to fully characterize those commercial interactions but also the recreation effect. So I think, I, I'm not sure how much of that is gonna be statutory, and how much of that is just gonna be pure investment in scaling up our sampling for recreation. Uh, yeah, Dr. We'll get to whoever wants to chime in. Yeah, I, I agree with Rick's comments about uh, increased monitoring. I think one of the big differences between the East Coast and the West Coast, the West Coast, even though there's a lot of people out there, there's a lot of undeveloped folks there's fewer access points. We're on the East Coast. We have really lots of development. You can go to any beach, anywhere. So sampling, part of the data comes from what are called intercepts, where people go and interview the people that are coming off boats. Um, so in aggregate, coastwide, you get a pretty decent number. A lot of sometimes are arguing about you know, it's, it's above or below. But when you break it down into these smaller scale pieces at the state level, that's where the uncertainty gets really compounded. And, you know, if we try to manage, um, you know, the, the Care Management Act talks about accountability measures, right? But how do you do that when you have individual fisheries? I mean, individual states that have a quota 
where the uncertainty in that estimate could be plus or minus 50%. Do you penalize them? Just be, and it could be a bad year. So I think uh, having some flexibility in, in, in the legal language about, about that and dealing with the uncertainty in the recreational level and maybe some guidance on how certain data can be used, I think would be really helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just add on to what Dr. Weedman said. So just bringing some of my South Atlanta experience here where we have, you know, in the Southeast region, we have the highest proportion of recreational England public um, throughout the nation. So this is something that we struggled with uh, for years and trying to align the data collection program with the management paradigm. And I agree that I think there might not be necessarily a statutory fix, but perhaps some additional clarification of guidance within the guidelines in terms of how accountability measures are applied for our recreational fisheries where there's a lot of data uncertainty. And we've tried different approaches in the South Atlantic. We have tried a moving three-year average evaluated against a, a point estimate. And I think, it's, I think it's the point estimate that really makes that difficult. We have also explored the use of individual um, reporting apps you know, to help uh, bring some additional clarity to some of our rare <coughs> fisheries. You know, I hate to say these words, but red snapper is one of those ones that, that comes to mind. Um, and it has, it has been going to the Gulf and, and a later Good listening luck. session. <laughs> 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 yeah, nice to <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, as Rick said, having some really, really focusing on concerted outreach and engagement with the recreational fishing public to impress upon them the importance of some of these alternative approaches through the use of some of these technologies and what they can bring and the advantages that they bring to anglers as well in terms of being able to go back and review your own data is also going to be important. So I think that combined with some of the flexibility that Dr. Newton mentioned in terms of the accountability measures and how they're applied might be. Just, just very briefly, uh, some good news in the recreational data world. Uh, we're always looking for that. Um, in the last couple of years, the states have taken over the administration of the intercept portion of the EMRIP service. The state agencies through ASMC are now going out. They're the ones that interview fishermen at marinas and docks and beaches and wherever folks may be coming back from fishing trips. So the states are conducting that part. And under state conduct, the successful intercepts have gone up about 30%, and the data is now recorded electronically instead of on paper, and, it, and the, the data now enters the system in about, within usually 24 hours rather than a couple of months. So, you know, we are working, and this is all for the same amount of funding that we had a few years ago. So about 30% of the data is in, in the system in, in, you know, just in hours versus days and months. So, you know, we are moving forward toward that, as, as Rick and Dr. Green both said, we can, you know, you can scale up the number of intercepts that you have. And the more people you talk to, the better your picture is of what people caught, how many they caught, what size fish they caught, all those sorts of things. So you, you know, that's, that's the key part of this. Is you, you, it's a two-part thing. You, how many fish did you catch, what size did you catch, and how many trips did you take? You multiply those together, and that's how you estimate recreational limits. So the more, more folks you can talk to and get a picture of what they caught, it, you know, that's moving in the right direction. And that's what decreases the uncertainty around those data really expensive to do it, but that, you know, if you want to continue under the current framework of, of sort of that two-part system of success rate and number of trips, it's like, you know, there are a number of tools out there, as Dr. Duval mentioned, of, of self-reporting apps and other things that, that come along. I think, you know, we, those should be explored, but there's some there's some biases potentially introduced by those. Are they just the average fishermen that are reporting, or are they run-of-the-mill fishermen, or, or are they, you know, folks are really into it for like two years and they're another cool app that's out there, whatever it is. So you know, there's a lot of things that we need to do with rec improving recreational data, makes the assessment better, makes the management better, so it's the right thing to work on. Um, so, Doctor, you mentioned something that made my head hurt a little bit. You talked about, you know, we, I'm hearing about shifting stocks and climate impacts. Everybody seems to agree that this is a problem that we've got to grapple with. Uh, but you talked about the rebuilding time frame as an example of a construct in the Magnuson-Stevens Act that with respect to some of these changes and some of these species just may be irrelevant because conditions are changing so much that they, rebuilding just might never occur. Uh, talk a little more about that. Are there any other uh, constructs in, in this uh, 
uh, Magnuson Act that, that really was pieced together before we were thinking a lot about climate change that we need to reimagine. Sure. So, um, sorry for making your head hurt. <laughs> My students don't the same thing. Um, I mean, with the reauthorization that happened in the mid '90s with the Sustainable Fisheries Act that mandated rebuilding, it was certainly a step in the right direction. Um, we had seen what would happen, what had happened to many of our fisheries with collapses, particularly in the Northeast and in Canada. Um, and we, part of the act implemented a rebuilding time frame. And, and, now, and if your stock gets declared overfished, um, you need to implement rebuilding. So you do this analysis, you forecast what the population is going to be in the future under a given harvest rate. Uh, you say, with some probability, where is it going to be and when does it cross that threshold? And if something is really far away from that threshold, then the harvest rate becomes really restrictive. Um, and oftentimes we don't meet those management targets because um, our projections assume past levels of productivity to get us there, and those change, right? So, um, and, and, some, and, and, and for most species, the, the timeline is about 10 years. The things on the West Coast, like rockfishes, where they live 100 years, the, the timelines are much longer. Um, <coughs> But here it's about 10 years, and these harvest rates can be particularly restrictive. Um, and if you don't meet the rebuilding target, you do another rebuilding analysis. My point is that we might not ever get to some of those benchmark biomass levels again, um, at least in our waters. If things move out to, to more productive waters, then they'll be fine in Canada or wherever. Um, but if we just keep our fishing mortality rates below the, the level that it defines overfishing, then eventually, if the ecosystem will allow, we will get there. It might take 10 years, it might take 20 years, but we'll get there. Uh, my concerns are where having really restricted harvest rates limit access to other fisheries as well. But I think we need to get the fishing mortality rates, and, and that's where my comment about focusing just on the fishing mortality and not the biomass level to some historical proxy that might not be attainable again, unfortunately. Well, a related question I had, um, because you're talking about the situation of a fishery that is uh, crashed, not because it's overfished, although we call it overfished, uh, but because of environmental factors. And uh, I, I've heard this in my first couple of listening sessions on the West Coast. Many of my salmon fishermen feel like the term overfished is disparaging because a lot of the fishing closures we've had with salmon have more to do with droughts and more to do with inland water projects and things like that than, than the actual fishing industry take. Uh, what does this panel think about the term overfished and whether it should uh, give way to something like depleted or something that's a little more nimble to describe uh, impacts that may not be uh, attributable to just fishing? Yeah, I, so certainly salmon are a great example of environmental sensitivity. Um, a lot of forage fish, and we talked a lot about forage fish on the council. Things that have a really high natural mortality rate, if you have one or two bad recruitments, the population is going to crash naturally. So things like sand uh, anchovies and sardines on the west coast, very prone to these big oscillations, which by our legal definition, if the biomass gets too low, we'll call them overfished. Um, in our region, though, I, I agree that the when you say it's overfished, you are implying fishing as the driver. Uh, in some cases, fishing may have what got what has gotten the stock there, but environment is preventing it from getting out of there. So um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit on the fence about whether or not we should be using that term. Um, have some thoughts down here, I think. My reaction is it's less important what we call it than what we do about it. Because if the stock is less productive for natural causes, you still can't fish it at prior rates. You have to adjust your fishing rate to match the productivity of the stock. That actually happened in, I don't know if I should call it a positive way for summer monitor in the last stock assessment where they found that fish were maturing later, they were smaller at age, and the stock was actually less productive. But because of that, the stock assessment said you could fish them at a higher rate and actually increase landings. So hopefully, and of course it depends on species to species, this should all sort itself out in the stock assessments over time, that lower productivity should be reflected in the later sentence. No, we do, just can't do this biomass target anymore. It's unrealistic. We have to reduce the biomass target to current conditions. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't manage the fish for the new biomass target. All right. Uh, 
right. Well, I have one more question, and then we'll open it up to the, the part of this program where uh, we ask for questions from others in attendance, uh, or even members of the panel if they want to ask each other questions. But uh, on, on this subject of, of climate change and shifting stocks, um, again, seemingly a universal concern, something we're going to have to tackle in a Magnuson reauthorization. What are the specific tools uh, that you think are needed uh, in a reauthorization that the, that the councils don't have right now? Uh, I've heard some good examples of councils stepping up and, and tackling this problem, but what are the, the additional tools that would be helpful? Uh, and a related question is, given um, the challenges, especially here in the Mid-Atlantic, with so many states and so many jurisdictional, so much jurisdictional air traffic control, I guess, uh, between the different uh, entities, is the governance structure uh, in Magnuson suitable to tackling uh, a conundrum like shifting stocks from climate change? So I welcome your thoughts on either of those two things. Yeah, so I touched on it briefly in my comments um, about fishery ecosystem plans and the need to build resilience in our ecosystems. Because I think preparing for climate change is about building resistance um, and resilience um, in communities, social, um, economic. But a fishery ecosystem plan, I'd like to describe what that is and how it can be a helpful tool moving forward. So as the um, EPAP panel, the Ecosystem Principles Advisory Panel, and the report to Congress described it, the FEP is an umbrella document containing information on the structure and function of the ecosystem in which fishing activities occur, so that managers can be aware of the effects of their decision and how these, what, uh, how these decisions impact the ecosystem and the effects, how it affects other components of the ecosystem. Um, so this is like a really important tool because it's a feedback loop. We set ecosystem level objectives, we characterize that ecosystem, we characterize the food web in that ecosystem, and then we create a series of indicators that help us measure our progress towards those objectives. And ultimately, this feedback loop is important because it tells us if we're staying on track. If we don't characterize that ecosystem, if we don't set ecosystem level objectives, then we really don't know where we're going. It's hard to build resilience into a system when you don't know what that system is. I think characterizing the ecosystem would be a very important tool. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just a real short comment uh, about this issue, the climate issue. Um, I have no doubt that certainly the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the government structure is there, the discretionary provision is there, I mean, the wheel is there to do exactly what we talked about. But the one thing I want to get across is that um, this climate regime that we're in may not just be a one-way street. Some animals may thrive under this, and some animals may move into our region. Right. And I think you know that will be one place where we absolutely suffer <clears throat> from the quick inability to take advantage of stocks moving to this. Thing. What can we do about it? Well, we'll impress upon the recent chair of the South Atlantic Council to make it happen. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I mean, I, I hear this in California as well. I mean, certainly the halibut stocks and other sure. things are moving around, and I, I have folks that would like to be able to catch more of them. Uh, is, it, is it about getting faster data uh, on the, the location and the, the size of these stocks? I think that um, what fishermen are witnessing, both recreational and commercial, on the water, um, should somehow make its way to the SSEs and the process of cooperative and collaborative management. I think that that will work, but again, let's just use Spanish mackerel, for example. Spanish mackerel could very easily, have already easily found their way in New Jersey waters. Um, it would take some heavy lifting, uh, administratively and regulatory, uh, to give us access to that fishery without, of course, impinging upon people who rely upon that fishery yeah. south of us. Yeah. You know, so whether that's a larger quota, yeah. whether that's you know, uh, something else. That's the end of that yeah. So already the, the fishery management plan for uh, Spain and the drug was going to, it's managed by the South Atlantic Council, but through 
throughout the New Atlantic Council's jurisdiction. So back when, um, I think in 1990, the uh, fishery management unit was extended throughout the New Atlantic Council's jurisdiction. So that, that, that is one tool that we have to um, try to have a more unified approach to governance. I think the issue with these, some of these species that are migratory coastal pelagics is that we've had the same regulations for the past 20 years where, you know, fishermen know what those regulations are, are they are just going out and fishing under those regulations. So if the if the status of those stocks change with regard to whether they're becoming more productive and becoming more abundant in areas north of the South Atlantic, then being able to um, perhaps more appropriately allocate a chunk of that biomass for management measures that are more specific to the Atlantic. So, who, who does the referee work between the councils in this situation? Is that now? Is that to <laughs> well, when it was Rick and I, we did referee <laughs> between the South Atlantic and the Mid Atlantic for uh, we went tilefish, which was another another yeah. good example, I think, um, of how you know a, an unknown sudden increase in biomass in a particular species occurred that really you know we had no idea it was there before, and that's why I think. Foundational thing is really having the ability to have change. So that's going to require additional resources for surveys that we have had. That said, you know, what Greg has described of you know, bringing fishermen's observations into that process, I think the councils have worked towards doing that through fishery performance reports that started in the Mid Atlantic. It's been copied by the South Atlantic now, those go to the SSCs as they're reviewing assessment for particular species. I think the issue is where. Maybe it's a species that really hasn't, you know, been seen before. So there's not a fishery for a couple just a while ago. Exactly yeah. for um, let's pick a species for snowy grouper in the Mid Atlantic, but they're catching their fish there. So I think that's that's where um, some of these conversations that the councils have been trying to have, and the Mid Atlantic Council is very instrumental. So do we have the authorities and the institutions in place now to address this situation, or do we need? We need to uh, do some work on that. I think we have the authorities now. If we talk about things like extending a fishery management unit, and we have the authorities in place that allow for council liaisons to um, attend a meeting, you know, I think Rick's suggestion of allowing those liaisons to actually have voting rights might be that's one of the things that could be addressed. Yeah, I would like to follow up. Thank you, Chair. I think, you know, this may be one of the few places that I would argue for something a little more formulaic. Um, Michelle brought up some great examples. And, you know, we're often accused of bad fisheries management, but not that long ago, Rhode Island was petitioning to become part of the mid -Atlantic. It's kind of embarrassing to be, you know, accused of bad geography as well. I think, um, I think there is a possibility with species like black sea bass and some of the farm or doing the house, this high abundance that they're dealing with, to maybe have something where the councils um, are automatically triggered into being involved in fishery management. I think, you know, it, it, I wouldn't say that there aren't other ways around that, as Rick suggested, is one very good option. And there also is that possible volunteering of stepping into joint management. Are you suggesting that a mechanism or a triggering uh, policy uh, could be used? I think it's one of the few places that, that, that I would consider to be. Tony? Yes. Yeah. 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 Everything that I'm hearing um, and with what I know what's going on at the agency, you know, a lot of the research vessels are aging, um, not getting the repairs that they need. And to me, this this comes down to more robust funding. Because I know the council members, the scientists, the agency employees, I think they're all doing it for the same reason that we all do it, because you love it. And, and you want to make a difference, and you want to do the right thing. But a lot of time, we're, they're constrained with budgetary issues, where I, I've heard it countless times in the commission, where we don't know, you know, what's really going on with this stock because there's no money for an assessment and we have to wait until this time. And I, I'm 
I'm the last person in the world you can ask my wife who would say throw money at a problem, right? I'm the cheapest human that ever lived. But um, I actually think that, you know, in this case, especially Noah, especially, they're, they're gonna do the right things with the money. That's, that's gonna answer a, a lot of the issues that we have. Um, that, but that is stronger set of assessments, more surveys for him. I have yet to run into anyone that doesn't agree with I, all this stuff. Right? I must be a smart guy. This, this is one of the universals here. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Mr. Chairman, so, uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of things that councils can do under the current statute um, in terms of coordination. So, uh, you know, twice a year the CCC, the Council Coordination Committee, meets and the leadership of all eight councils are present. Um, that, that's a forum where we can uh, share what our current challenges are or what the councils can share what their current challenges are. Um, and, and, and that's an area where, or that's, that's a venue where we've been able to uh, address a number of coordination type challenges. So, uh, for example, before we ever did our deep sea coral action, uh, we had some uh, discussions there about how we might coordinate along the east coast and, and we've since taken action. Um, so, if, if the CCC wanted to stand up some uh, working groups, for example, of the Atlantic Councils, they could do that uh, to facilitate and promote that type of coordination. Um, I think where I think where we face the greatest challenges is, is when we deal with a stock in which we have no headroom, so we have no we have no margin for error uh, under the quota, and the quota may be fully utilized and the stock shifts. Um, so, just uh, Spanish market already came up, but. Spanish mackerel abundance this year in the Mid Atlantic is off the charts. So, off Virginia Beach and points north uh, and up in Chesapeake Bay, Spanish mackerel abundance was tremendous. So, the catch has been higher than normal. Um, that resulted in an early commercial closure of the fishery in North Carolina, so the South Atlantic. Um, and so, when we get into situa situations like that, then access is a problem, Account accounting is a problem. We don't have the flexibility to um, fish opportunistically as they come in there. Um, by the same token, I've already said, as, as things change, we need to be careful. So there's a balance to be struck, and I think, I think part of that balance relates to how do we deal with developing fisheries uh, in the act, and I think there's a, there's a place for that. Um, but but that's, that's the challenge we face when we don't have any headroom. And the same is true for the allocation discussion, because as, fit, as fish stocks shift, if the, quota, if the quotas that are allocated out state by state are fully utilized, then it turns into a zero-sum game. And under those conditions, you can sit around the table and say, yeah, there are technical ways that we can develop adaptive strategies to deal with this, but people that have access to that resource with a highly mobile fleet are not willing to give it up to accommodate those that want to have access to the resource. And, and that's, just a, um, that, that's just a description of the rea that reality politically uh, that makes it very difficult. So um, while we, we might be able to do it technically, it's, it's hard to put it into practice. But figuring out I think how to deal with these things as a change is important. Um, in my home state of Virginia, uh, the abundance of white shrimp in the Chesapeake Bay has increased by an order of magnitude in the last 15 years. Uh, we have just allowed the development of a very small experimental shrimp fishery in Virginia state waters. And the boats have, most of the trips are observed. There are only six boats in the fishery now, very tightly controlled. Um, that's allowing for orderly evaluation of, you know, is this a viable fishery? Uh, what, are the, what are the ecological and bycatch implications of this? Um, and, and just looking at it in a, in a controlled way. Um, so that's a potential model for the federal fisheries? Well, it's, I, I, think, I, 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 think it, I think it's an example of how orderly development can occur um, on, on, a, on a very, on a very um, cautionary basis. Um, but, but these other issues are real challenges when things like Spanish mackerel is great to get up in New Jersey. How do you how do you deal with that if they're managed under an FMP in the South Atlantic? Um, that and I would I would suggest that that's that's a space for further investigation and discussion uh, by your committee. Um, because I think that is something that, that would benefit from additional examples. Well, I, I appreciate that. Let's uh, open it up to questions or comments from the public. So just step right up to the microphone if you would. Tell us your name so that we have it in the record. Uh, thank you uh, from, from Hoffman for inviting us here today. I'm David Curson, and I'm the uh, Director of Bird Conservation and the Interim Executive Director for Audubon, Maryland, D.C. That's the Maryland, D.C. 
say the office of the National Audubon Society. I've lived in Maryland for 16 years. And I really enjoy taking my gigs now, bird watching and uh, visiting uh, Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Coast. And um, I'd like to say that um, the Magnus and Stevens Act is, uh, is working and it's really important to keep it strong. Um, and uh, it's, it's done a lot of good, um, saving, uh, helping uh, fishing stocks. Um, one thing I'd like to make sure happens with the reauthorization is that forage fish are adequately protected. We've heard a lot about forage fish today. And um, many bird species really depend on those forage fish. Uh, a great range, you know, not just the ospreys that we hear about a lot, but also uh, wintering bird species like gannets and red-bellied loons, common loons, uh, and then uh, birds that come here in the, uh, in the spring and summer, terns, uh, royal terns, uh, common terns, black skimmers. And some of these birds are in trouble. In Maryland, uh, black skimmer, uh, royal tern, and common tern are all now uh, listed as endangered. Now, the reason for that endangerment is not actually declining fish stocks, it's limited nest sites. But declines in forage fish will harm these birds as well and act as an extra uh, kind of pressure point on them. So, uh, and also there's really apparent that there's so much, uh, they're treated as cash fish. The forage fish are, are way overfished. And oh, I'd like to have a question too. I'm wondering whether this reduction fishing that we've heard about, I didn't know that term before, is that the main or the sole source of fishing uh, for forage fish, because it really seems to be uh, way undervaluing uh, the true value of forage fish. And it's important that the, uh, the MSA um, sets uh, limits uh, for the forage fish, allows them to vary according to the stock size, um, and that we have the, uh, they're managed above, way above uh, maximum sustainable yield, so that we're accounting for the needs of uh, wildlife predators uh, like birds and other marine life. That. Okay. Uh, I'd love to hear an answer to the question. Paul, did you want to answer that question about reduction fishing? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. The, um, the Atlantic menhaden is, that's the bunker fish we're referring to. So the, the normal range is from Maine to Florida. And that commercial fishery is divided into two sections. There's the reduction fishery, and then there's the bait fishery. The bait fishery is not bait as per se for putting on a hook. It's more for trap bait. Uh, I'm sure Greg can address it, but it's like a 80-20 split. 80% goes to the reduction fleet, and then 20% goes to uh, the bait fleet. So um, as an organization, my, my organization, Mandate Defenders, looks at the reduction industry as an industrialized process. So they pull a 196-foot vessel into a small area, and they fill that ship up to the, to the gunnels with 1.8 to 2 million fish at a time, and then they steam back and, and grind them up. Um, so that uh, has an effect on localized depletion. So if you're talking about a skimmer flying around the back of the bay, if these fish are removed, um, it has an impact. However, you have to recognize that these menhaden have, have different sizes during their lives. So obviously a striped bass would eat a larger fish than a, a skimmer. So the immature would be very important. So if those fish are not spawning in that area, the fry are not returning to the estuary, and the skimmers are not are not feeding, and they'll they're in trouble. If they're already in trouble with their nesting areas, they're certainly going to be, you know, for lack of nutrition. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope that helps. Yeah. Appreciate your comments, and just so you know, uh, my localized audubon network has about 
In the last 70 years, a staggered 70% of all seagrass from petrols to puffins have declined in large numbers. Under a new MSA, we have the opportunity to reverse this terrible trend. We can accomplish this by uh, revising the, the bycatch definition to include seagrass as protected living sources. Um, and I know there's many people to speak up, so that's what I'm going to say. What about the sea seabird bycatch? Yes. Okay. So, um, and as and the MSA is written now, marine mammals and turtles are included under its definition, but not seabirds. Unfortunately, our country's only fishery management law is failing to protect vulnerable wildlife. Today, seabird populations such as Atlantic puffins are struggling to reproduce successfully. Allowing expanded protected living resources definition will offer much needed protection that seabirds need to bounce back. Um, Seabirds play an important role in our ocean um, ecosystem and expanding definitions to account for predator needs under the NSA is a critical step. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Other comments or questions? Good afternoon. My name is Liz Todd and I'm a Virginia resident. Um, and I grew up fishing off the coast of New Jersey. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to comment as well. Um, seabirds are in trouble, and as we've mentioned, since the 1950s, almost 70% of the population has declined. And today, climate change is making that even, making it even hard, harder to raise healthy chicks. Around the world, we also see many forest fish populations like anchovies, menhaden, and shad are declining due to ocean warming and overfishing. These tiny fish aren't just the food for seabirds like Atlantic puffins, though. But they're also a main food source for larger fish like summer flounder and black sea bass. Forage fish are the touchstone that countless seafood and fishing jobs across the Mid-Atlantic region rely on. And as Congress looks to reauthorize the MSA, I ask that our country's only federal fisheries management law strive to successfully manage forage fish and ensure that seabirds are kept out of our nets. Good afternoon, Representative Tuffman. My name is Hunter Bailey, and I'm a Virginia resident. I also work for the International Alliances Program at the National Audubon Society. I write to voice my support for strengthening the Madison Stephen Act, as it does not go far enough in conserving forage fish, the main source of food for many migratory bird species. Forage fish are vital to a healthy food web. They are the small, abundant fish upon which larger predators depend on. Without them, humans and wildlife will suffer. In fact, forage fish populations are currently declining. Today, birds such as puffins, terns, and pelicans have to cover greater distances than in years past in order to feed their offspring. Fishermen also have to crop further, investing more resources than before for increasingly smaller yields. To reverse these worrying trends, we have to make changes informed by sound ocean science to help both seabird populations and fishing communities become more resilient. Recommendations to improve the Magnuson Stephen Act include defining forage fish in the Magnuson Stephen Act, accounting for predator needs when deciding how many forage fish can be caught, ensuring forage fish catch levels are set according to the annual size of the stock, and avoiding fishing altogether when the stock reaches a depleted status. With these changes to the MSA, we will give forage fish a fighting chance. We will also be helping migratory bird species by ensuring they will have plenty of fish to eat when they visit our country. And regardless of whether one fishes or not, all of us would benefit tremendously from a healthy, vibrant, marine environment. Thank you for an opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I think everybody acknowledges the need for protecting forage fish. I think the question is how much. Um, I did my PhD actually on the archetype for ecosystem-based management, which was Antarctic Pro, which uh, back in the early 1980s, they, uh, the international agency that manages them, the acronym is CAMELAR, uh, they basically said that we are going to set a cap before the fishery develops and it's currently at 10% of the estimated biomass of what they think is down there in the Southern Ocean. Southern Ocean is quite different in, in that the, the fishery was not developed at the time. The only people fishing were the Soviets, and so they were easily excluded from the discussion. Um, and we're nowhere near that level, but my concern about, I, I absolutely think that forage fish should be included in, in the authorized MSA, but I have concerns about prescript, very prescriptive language and how it's going to be. Dr. Duvall mentioned a little bit about that. Um, that sometimes things, when they get into the legalese, so to speak, um, gets interpreted a very 
specific way and can make it challenging. And there may be very different cases with forage fish. So for example, some bird species do not eat menhaden or that they don't do well with menhaden because their body shape is too big to, for them to swallow. Others need sand lance, others need herring, mackerel. So with natural fluctuations or fishing induced fluctuations with forage fish, we're gonna see different birds respond differently. Um, currently menhaden are at record numbers in coast wide, uh, while herring and mackerel are low. We don't know as much about sand lance because they're not well surveyed. But um, I just think caution is needed in how the concerns of, of the uh, broader community, which I'm certainly in support of, get translated into legal speed. Other comments or questions? I think we're, we're near the end here, so yeah, please. Good afternoon, Connors and Muffin. My name is Jamal Ramos, and I'm a resident of Baltimore. One of Maryland's most prized shorebirds is under threat. The high pink lover is a small, sandy colored bird with short orange legs and black bands across its forehead. This bird can be found throughout the region, but here at home it is in danger. Today, these birds, normally found in the eastern shores of Assateague Island in Worcester County, are becoming hard to find. We cannot let the piping plover perish. I ask that the, mag the next Magnuson Stevens Act properly define and protect seabirds, including shorebirds and coastal birds, so Maryland's piping plover has a planning chance of survival. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I think there was one other. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Mark Eustace. I'm a resident of Maryland. Uh, as something of an external um, observer of the council and commission process, um, and having worked in FACA uh, commissions in uh, DC. Uh, one of the things that I see is that there's a unanimity about um, improved assessment, and in particular, the frequency, uh, the quantity, and the quality. If you look at the makeup and construct of coastal communities, they've gone from 60, 70 years ago of small boat fisheries into recreational fisheries. We're still operating on the small boat fisheries data collection model, when we should probably be funding and looking at uh, funding for recreational fishery. So I would advocate for vastly improved funding with prescriptive language to put in, into the MSA so that there's no reprogramming of the funding within NOAA, so that it stays on the assessment. Prescriptive on how the money's used, not on recreational anglers being mandated to. Um, well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> recreation, mandated recreational reporting, mandated funding for assessments that happen every three to five years, not every 10, 15 years, so that parliamentarianism can't kick the can down the road that we don't have the science to make a decision. And I would aver that MSA protection works very well from three miles out. And I believe that MSA protection should extend from three miles out to the fall line to cover diatomous fishes as well as the highly migratory species. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, uh, we have reached the end. I think we said that we would be out of here at this point. So. Uh, let me start by just thanking uh, all of our panelists. There's an incredible amount of expertise and experience and wisdom uh, in this diverse panel. I have learned a lot. I really want to thank you for sharing your knowledge with me and with my staff. Uh, I've got uh, three staffers here with me, and we have been scribbling notes, and you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, and uh, to the point that was raised by Greg, and I know others will share this concern, this isn't the last chance we'll have to talk about these issues. I hope this will be an ongoing conversation, but it's certainly very, very valuable to me. And I want to thank all of you for participating uh, and offering your comments to those who did. Uh, we are now going to take this show uh, on the road to Seattle. That's my next stop. Uh, and uh, each time I do one of these listening sessions, I, I learn a lot uh, and gain some really interesting regional perspectives. So. Thanks so much for helping what I hope will be uh, a great um, ground up process that leads to uh, good legislation. Stay tuned and thanks very much.